But I'm alarmed at reading a report from an organisation that compiles data from a whole lot of different sources about what's going on in the real estate industry who warn us, along with and on top of the warnings from the Reserve Bank, the OECD, from the big banks, pretty much everyone involved in property, that Australia is at risk of a significant number of defaults and what is called mortgage stress is on the rise. Martin North is from Digital Finance Analytics, who compile this sort of data for the property industry and the banks. Martin, good morning to you. Good morning, John. Now, we're not just talking about a snapshot here. This is much, much more. You've looked at 767,000 households now in mortgage stress. Where mostly are they? Yeah, so this is a a concerning trend and it's a growing trend. And uh, essentially, there's quite a smattering across the country. But what's significant about the research that we've done is that we've highlighted that it isn't just in the the usual suspects, in other words, the mortgage belts, you know, the, the, the battling areas that you might expect. We're seeing households in all sorts of different areas now experiencing quite some difficulty in just managing those mortgage repayments. And th- there are some drivers that relate to the fact that incomes are static or falling in real terms and mortgage rates have been rising. Costs of living, of course, are accelerating away and underemployment is also part of the problem. So, so this is this is an issue now that is significantly um, penetrating across Australia, touching a whole bunch of different households, and potentially has some economic effects. I think Western Australia, not surprisingly, boom bust over there because of the mining industry and the nature of their economy. But Victoria, featuring heavily in your top ten areas at risk, particularly Point Cook, Werribee, Derrimut, Hoppers Crossing, Cranbourne. Uh, all sorts of areas on the outer fringe of Melbourne are featuring in your top 10. Why do you think that is? Well, um, yep. The the fact is that um, prices have been rising quite significantly and people have been reaching for ever larger mortgages to get into the market. So people have fundamentally bigger debts than previously. And of course, the data from the RBA shows that our debt to income ratio is higher than it's ever been as a, as a country. So that, that's sort of part of the problem. But then you've got to look uh, at things like what are the, the day-to-day costs of living. And so the, the CPI data that we get is sort of averaged quite dramatically, but it doesn't really get to the heart of real household um, expenses and what we're finding is things like childcare costs, school fees, those sorts of things, you know, rates. All those costs have gone up a lot. And then the fact that these larger mortgages, because prices have gone up, um, are being impacted by interest rate rises. And you know, don't underestimate the small incremental interest rate rise translates into quite a big dollar a month increase when you've got a big mortgage. I've had a look at your top 20 areas that are most at risk, the postcodes. They're all in West Australia, Victoria and Queensland. There are none in the Rust Belt economies of Tasmania or South Australia and remarkably none in New South Wales in the top 10. Why? Yeah, so um, this is looking at, we sorted this particular list by the number of risk of default. And in fact, there's uh, some in New South Wales just below the, the top 20. Um, so, <clears throat> so it's a combination of the number of people living in, living in a household plus the fact that uh, we've, we're looking at the people who are actually in financial difficulty in those postcodes. So, so that's, that's, that's why we're seeing it. Well, what we've discovered in New South Wales is that we've got um, uh, some degree of stress in, in sort of lots of different areas, but it's, it's a little less concentrated than in Victoria. So we seem to have in Victoria some particular postcodes where I guess it's because of the significant population growth and there's been significant property development in those areas. So effectively, there's a degree of concentration, and that's why we, we, we're seeing those in the top 20. Plus the fact that the, whilst the economic um, indicators are reasonably good in Victoria, if you actually look at um, you know, real incomes, they are actually uh, not growing. And CPI in Victoria, from what the ABS said last week, was, was 1% higher in Victoria. So, so cost of living are rising faster ah. in Victoria than elsewhere. Now we're getting down to it. We've got this two-speed economy. What's going on in the mining states, particularly in the West, has got nothing to do with what's going on here. So the bottom line here for the Victorian postcodes, and we're talking here about Point Cook, Werribee, uh, rattling off that list again, mm. what's happening here is people are overextended, they're paying too much for the houses they're buying and incomes aren't growing to keep up with, with their, their commitments, in other words. So uh, 
in fact, the Victorian disease is completely different to the West Australian disease. That's exactly right. So in WA, we've got prices falling significantly, unemployment rising, and uh, you know lots of issues there. But in Victoria... And people are packing up and leaving. I mean, there what, are ghost towns up there. It, it's pretty scary what's, hap- what's happening there. But, but yeah, it's a different set of economic drivers in, in, in Victoria. This static income thing that we're talking about, right, this is really, really significant, and, it, and it's relatively new. Now, the last two or three years, but if you look carefully, you'll find that most people working in the private sector have had no pay rise for two or three years. The public sector is doing a bit better, There's, you know, if you're okay in that sector, but, but private sector employees are actually struggling. And, and it's a combination of no income growth and underemployment. In other words, people aren't getting the hours that they want, so effectively not bringing home as much as they would like to. Now, in the early 2000s, where we had very strong property price growth and mortgage growth, we had very, very strong income growth to match. So effectively, things worked okay. But this time around, we've got the combination of very large mortgages and, uh, of course, mortgage rates rising, but income static or falling in real terms. That's the difference. And, and what that means is that this is not going to get worked out anytime soon. So all this talk about housing affordability and helping new people to get into, into the market is missing the key point, right? These are people in the market now with their properties, dealing with these mortgages, dealing with the day-to-day issues of trying to manage their finances. And all right. It, so it's there's the up. disease. Now, yeah. just finally, can you prescribe the medicine? If people are at risk, what's the best way of avoiding default? Well, so I think there's three things to say. The first is that only half the households that we actually survey actually have a formal household budget so they know what they're spending uh, and what, the, what they're earning and how it all, all works out. And some people don't want to look and some people, you know, don't, never bother. So first, make sure you've got a household budget that really works and gives you a sense of what it is that you are spending your money on. Secondly, you've got to sort of make some choices about where you spend your money. And some people would say things like, you know, high-speed internet connectivity on the phone and all those things is, is, is really, really critical. The question is, is critical as paying that mortgage? So there's some prioritization there. And things like don't put more on credit cards because credit cards actually have very high interest rates. So, so get to grips with your finances. The third point is the banks have an obligation to help people if they are getting into difficulty. So... Oh. Don't put your head in the sand. Huh? Did you, do, you, do you really want to just stop and reflect on what you just said then? Well, they do. They have an obligation. It's, a, it's, 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 it's in law. They have an obligation to help people. So if you're in difficulty... We must be on different planets, Martin. Well, they have an obligation. Um, so the, the point is that many people actually think that things will be okay and just sort of muddle on through. What I would say is... If you are in, you know, in, in difficulty, if you look as though you've got difficulty, have a conversation with, with, with your bank and see what can be done because there are things that they can do to, to help. But many people muddle on for too long and then essentially get to the point where they've got no choice but, but to sell. Now, you know, selling Hope is, always is a not risk. a strategy. Hoping no. is not a strategy. Get advice, get help and stop spending. No Correct. matter what you're spending on, just stop. That's the hard part. I'm no better at it than anybody else. Thank you, Martin. Good to talk to you. Martin North, Principal of Digital Finance Analytics. You've